It's very difficult to, uh, to express, uh, not simply the gratitude tomorrow for the opportunity to be with you, but the very fact that he's created here essentially a cauldron that as it continues to bubble the way this conference is demonstrated, with the effervescence of scientific ideas that are now continuously being translated into ways that are going to change people's lives, whether it's, as we just heard, with atherosclerotic disease or with pulmonary hypertension, you literally are changing the world. And so what I want to talk to you about today is, is change. Change that is of such a pace and such a magnitude that it really is, is unprecedented in, in history. And it's change that is primarily affecting medicine and healthcare in a way that it's not simply anymore a linear extrapolation of the past, but actually a phase change. A change in which, in medicine, the future will look no more like the past than a butterfly looks like a caterpillar. It's that profound. It's that significant. It, in fact, is probably today the a period of time in which we're going through the most profound transformation that's ever occurred in, in the history of medicine. And so I've spoken to you before, as I've had the privilege of coming and spend time with you, about this metamorphosis and about some of the implications that it has for our cyclical ecosystem of discovery, development, and delivery, and talk to you about some of the policy changes and some of the things that would occur in the ecosystem that we live in and function, and how we would be able to accelerate the process of really bringing science to its full fruition where it is, in fact, impacting people's lives. What I want to talk to you a little bit more about today is another aspect of the metamorphosis, another part of what's emerging in this new reality, and that is the profound transformations that are occurring in the scientific foundations of medicine. And so in order to do that, I'll repeat some of the things I've told you before at the very outset to set the stage, especially for those of you I haven't had an opportunity to share this with before. And so the first thing to appreciate is that this moment in time that we're in at the beginning of the 21st century actually has a, a historical perspective that goes back to 100 years ago. And at the turn of the 20th century, in the very early part of the 20th century, people like you and me were sitting in rooms like this, and the fundamental quest, the fundamental question that people were grappling with at it was to understand the fundamental nature of matter and of energy. And so the focus of science and technology 100 years ago was on the atom and its nucleus. We wanted to understand what we were made of, what the universe was made of at its most fundamental level. And so that quest, as they began to unravel the secrets of the atom and its nucleus, that knowledge that emanated from that quest changed the course of civilization forever. It changed the world we live in. It gave us everything from atomic energy to quantum mechanics and material sciences, and also, obviously, the understanding of that little thing that goes around the outside of the nucleus, the electron. And so we're all strapped to iPhones and Blackberries and walking around with computers in front of all of us. That progress, as it evolved, over the course of the 20th century allowed science and technology to begin to change the question from understanding the fundamental nature of matter to beginning to understand the fundamental nature of life itself. 
And at about the mid-portion of the 20th century, the discovery of DNA, that quest began to take shape in that today, where we sit now, we are beginning to unravel the secrets of the cell and its nucleus. And that knowledge is once again changing the course of civilization, changing the world we live in. It's changing our concepts and our understanding of life processes such that we're using that knowledge to change agriculture and the production of food with bioengineered foods and animals. It's changing the nature of what we can do with the environment and energy. It simply is having enormous consequences, as did the discovery of the secrets of the atom and its nucleus. It's having consequences even with regard to biodefense and whether we will or won't destroy civilization by modification of life. But where the most profound effects are already being seen in this metamorphosis, in this transformation, is in medicine. And that was an, an opportunity that was led primarily by the evolution of our study of, of cancer, of oncology. Because oncology gave us the platform to study life. We could study a cell that was the most egregious disorder of life, the disorder of growth and differentiation that results in the disease we recognize as cancer. And we had a lot of material to work with because people would give people like me all the cancer we wanted to work with. It wasn't take a part of it, it was take all of it. And so cancer became a foundational piece, but what was at the heart of our ability to start to unravel the secrets of the cancer cell and therefore begin to understand some of the principles of life itself was the fact we were able, through the discovery of DNA and using the tools that emanated from the transformation of the 20th century, material sciences and computational sciences with computers, the tools merged in a way that we have exponentially accelerated our ability to unravel the secrets. One of the things that led to that acceleration was the recognition by society that cancer was a disease that was essentially destroying our society. And so we committed as a nation to put the parts and pieces together. We be, through the National Cancer Act of 1971, we mobilized the infrastructure and we created new models for being able to do research, models that moved us into multidisciplinary integrated research and care, and it accelerated the ability to have new tools and materials to work with. So you now, at the beginning of the 21st century, are benefiting from the progress that came about in that fourth quarter of the 20th century starting at about in the mid-1970s, when we went through this exponential growth. The discovery of, of the life sciences as the emerging opportunity in the 21st century is once again getting accelerated because it's now appreciated that progress in the life sciences is really a dominant feature of what will determine the future of societies, both from the point of view of human development, as well as from the appreciation and understanding that the life sciences will be a foundational piece of economies and financial capital. And so once again, we're in this midst of a commitment of resources and evolution in our ability to put the parts and pieces together, and particularly to begin to see for the first time that not only can we begin to detect and prevent and eliminate disease, but also to modulate it, and in addition to that, be able to restore health once disease has had its effect. And that has come about by virtue of the beginning understanding of not just the cancer cell, but the stem cell, the very basis of life. 
The process, as I told you before, is now inherent in our ecosystem of a circular ability to go through the phases of discovery, development, and delivery with all of the kinds of, of uh, commitment uh, that we need with regard to intellectual and financial resources and the, and the creation of infrastructure. That's what you're doing here. That's the magic of what is so special about what's been created here at Methodist. You have, in a sense, become the preeminent example of this new ecosystem and this new way of continuing to drive the transformation, the metamorphosis that will define the 21st century. The critical element of why this is a phase change and why it's not simply a linear extrapolation of the past is that as we have evolved this knowledge of the fundamental genetic, molecular, and cellular mechanisms that are responsible for life and egregious disorders of life, we've moved and changed the paradigm. The traditional paradigm of medicine from the time it was the inception of medicine, going back as far as you want to Hippocrates or wherever, the entire paradigm up until just the latter part of the 20th century was a paradigm of medicine based on the observation of the manifestations of disease as an event. We detected or saw or heard or felt an abnormality and we made a diagnosis, a lump in a woman's breast, a shadow on a chest x-ray. The problem with that is that we could become more sophisticated about our ability to see or hear or detect with CT scans or MRIs or ultrasounds. We could become more sophisticated with a microscope about our diagnoses. But the fact of the matter is, making the diagnosis was completely disassociated from our understanding about what to do about it. It was a discontinuous process. The, the tipping point of the metamorphosis was that the paradigm changed in the latter part of the 20th century from observing manifestations to beginning to understand the fundamental mechanisms of the disease process. The process of beginning and, and evolution and end and was, we understood the mechanisms associated with the various phases of that disease process, we begin to intuitively know what the intervention should be to alter or change the process. It becomes, if you will, an engineering challenge. And so the, the ability to then understand mechanisms rather than observe manifestations was the tipping point that creates this as a metamorphosis and not a linear extrapolation of the past. One of the things that becomes a derivative of the kind of progress that's been made is that there are some themes that are emerging from this metamorphosis, some things that are unique about the butterfly that weren't quite true of the caterpillar. And what I want to do is spend some time with you today just going through three of those particular themes or what will be emerging determinants of the fundamental nature of the butterfly, the, the essence of medicine in the 21st century. Three that I've chosen to talk to you briefly about today are one stem cell biology, Biology is a digital science and the intersection of the physical and life sciences. Stem cell biology really comes down to the fact that as we have understood these fundamental mechanisms of growth and differentiation, we now have the tool to be able to truly alter or change life processes. We can genetically re-engineer life we can also not only eliminate disease, but we can actually recreate and restore 
the diseased organ. That transformation, that determinant, has as yet untold numbers of implications, and we're only beginning to see the very first and early aspects of what stem cell biology will lead to. We're able to reboot the software of the genetic code. We now can alter or change those determinants which will define what the ultimate outcome will be of that cell, that tissue, that organ, or that organism. And as we are beginning to understand the, the nature of the cell and its determinants, we also are appreciating the integration of that cell with its microenvironment and the role that occurs in the dynamic interaction between the seed and the soil, if you will. And beginning to appreciate the fact that as these processes are evolving, being driven by these fundamental mechanisms and being shaped and molded by the environment they find themselves in, that there are also additional forces that are determining that ultimate outcome of that life processes. And so, for example, since we talked earlier about blood vessels, we now recognize that you can have the cellular components, you can have the extracellular components, or matrix, if you will, that will give you the fundamental constituents that enable you to generate the structure of a blood vessel, but it won't happen unless you subject that process to the dynamic physical force of a pulsating mechanism that engenders in that evolving tissue its fundamental nature to be a blood vessel. And finally, we're be able, being able to now reprogram and edit the very instruction manual of life itself, and you're all aware of the emerging opportunities in gene deletion and replacement and things like CRISPR-Cas9. So stem cell biology, as it's emerging, will fundamentally shape and alter the future of medicine in the 21st century as part of this metamorphosis process. The other tremendously important and critical element that's emerged from some of the progress that we've made that will shape the future in profound ways is that biology is now a digital science. It's no longer just simply qualitative, it's quantitative. And the quantification of biology as a digital science allows us to start to elucidate the laws that underpin the biological processes. So just as in physics, where there are fundamental laws that govern the behavior of the elements in nature, we're now beginning to be able to appreciate that there are fundamental laws that are subject to quantification that drive biological processes. And so physics in the past benefited from the fact that there were always two branches. There was experimental physics and theoretical physics. And Einstein could work out on a blackboard what Fermi was trying to figure out in a laboratory. Biology has never had theoretical biology. It's always been essentially an experimental science. But today, with biology becoming a digital science and our understanding of the concepts that underpin that, we are beginning to see the emergence of biology as a, as a theoretical science. And so the quantification of biology and the creation of digital data and recognizing that even at the very most fundamental level, DNA is simply that. It's a code, a digital code. That begins the creation of the mathematical formulas to explain order in biological systems, but also we have, as an, again, the emergence of the technologies of the 20th century, computational tools, 
the power to capture and analyze variance, which is the uniqueness of biological processes. So biology has both order and variance at the same time, and we're beginning to figure out and understand how to use that to be and begin to model life processes in silico. We're already seeing that in the way that it's affecting protein, uh, proteomics, and, and even simply drug discovery kind of processes. But there are other processes that are beginning to emerge that we're beginning to understand and appreciate. So in the honor of Dr. Moro Ferrari, my phenomenal Italian friend, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about Fibonacci numbers. So Fibonacci was an Italian mathematician who brought us out of Arabic numbers the sequence of one through nine and zero, so the 10 numbers. But one of the other things he did was appreciate that there was a sequence. And the sequence would be that if you took zero and the number and then added those two numbers together, and you continued that process, you got a series. So if you add zero and one, you get one. You add one and one, you get two. You add two and one, you get three. So if you keep adding the last two numbers you, to the next number, you get a series. And then if you divide one number by the previous number, you get a ratio that's called phi. And it's constant. It's 1.618. And he recognized that in nature, there, or that in, in this mathematical formula, if you take a triangle and you create a square, what's left becomes a sequence that matches Fibonacci numbers. And if you connect the sectors, you get a mathematical formula of a spiral. And that ratio in that spiral of 1.168 is called the golden ratio. It's a logarithmic spiral. Interestingly enough, that is also a part of nature. And so the spiral of the Nautilus shell fits the Fibonacci numbers and the golden ratio. And so we begin to find in nature that there's order. And the order follows mathematical principles. And it's not just in the Nautilus shell, but it turns out that the human face is a, fits the golden ratio. Interestingly about the human face is the more it fits the ratio, the perception is greater of attractiveness. The more it deviates from the golden ratio, the less attractive we perceive that face. But it's also true in the development of branching trees, and it's true in the creation of a flower. So physics and mathematics are as integral a part of biology as they are of material sciences. The informatics is leading us in a variety of different directions as we see biology as a digital science. It's a transformation of first data, which then has to be aggregated into information, analyzed into knowledge, and then ultimately accumulated as wisdom. It's occurring in our understanding of basic life processes, but these tools of digital science are also enabling us to manage medicine in itself. And so although I indicated that there were mathematical principles that involved order, there are mathematical issues having to do with variance in nature. We are biologically different. And there's difference in variance that can be quantified and analyzed. Variance in disease states, variance in patients and patient characteristics, and variance in the things we do to perturb those systems called a therapeutics or elsewise. And so one of the other things that's emerging in our understanding of, of biology as a digital science and our embracing of digital tools and computational tools and computational science is we're able to apply that in the clinical dimension 
as well as in the basic biologic research dimension. And so management of variance in process permits us to optimize that process. That's a fundamental principle in any um, engineering process that, that reduction of variance around the mean improves quality and reduces waste. It's the principle of Deming that revolutionized the manufacturing of the automobile industry in Japan. And so as we begin to apply these tools clinically, what we're beginning to see is that we have in any disease or any intervention, we have a skewed distribution across variants. I'll give you one specific example that we did when I was at FDA commissioner. Coumadin is one of the most widely prescribed drugs that we use as an anticoagulant. And there's a wide distribution or variance with regard to the optimization of the dose of Coumadin. Unlike aspirin, where it's much easier to be able to apply a uniform dose to a population, it's more difficult with a drug like Coumadin. So you generally have an optimal dose, but you have a wide skew around that. We used the ability to apply a genomic test that could improve, not make perfect, but improve our ability to be predictive with regard to the optimal dose of Coumadin for a particular patient. And by reducing the variance, that increases the optimum quality. And so more patients were getting the optimum dose, fewer patients getting insufficient dose and, and persistent strokes and clots due to atrial fib, et cetera, and fewer patients getting GI hemorrhage and emergency room visits uh, with excessive bleeding. And so quality improved, waste dropped out, and even after you paid the, for the genomic test in everyone, there was a net savings of about $400 million to the healthcare system. And so biology as a digital science is affecting us both from the point of view of our understanding of the nature of life, but also our ability to begin to manage medicine as a, um, there we go, manage medicine from the perspective of applying these new tools. Finally, um, one other way to begin to think about th this particular aspect uh, of, of, the, of the evolution is to begin to see that these complex diseases uh, with these complex mechanisms that we're beginning to be able to quantify and identify, complex diseases will ultimately require complex solutions. And much of the discussion that occurred just previously really began to bring this point home. And so we're beginning to think that maybe the computer has something else to teach us. So what's of value in that laptop in front of you is that it's doing something for you that has value or worth. You're taking notes. Uh, maybe some of you are playing games or whatever, but it's of value to you. In medicine, we've based, been basically approaching disease from the point of view of individual components. But complex diseases will rarely, if ever, be totally, completely resolved by a single component. We're learning more and more that it requires the complex integration or interaction of components. And so in that laptop, you have a hard drive, you have a CD-ROM, you have a microprocessor, you have software. We'll be, that concept is, be, is emerging as it relates to what do we need in medicine. To deal with complex diseases, the new biomedical model for precision medicine basically says we need a laptop that has four components. We need a target, we need a payload, we need delivery system, and we need monitoring. And so all, each of these are beginning to emerge as unique opportunities to 
continuously radically transform that disease process, understanding those fundamental mechanisms. And so you have a variety of choices for target, but you have to know what the target is. You have a variety of choices for whether, in fact, you had the desired effect when you got the appropriate payload delivered to the appropriate target. Each of these are evolving at almost exponential rate, but what isn't evolving at the same rate is our ability to understand how to put them together in an integrated interoperable system. And so what will link this biomedical computer? What's linking, the, what's working in your laptop right now with those various components is the little electron that's wandering around through all of them, communicating and connecting. In our data, our model, it's data. We need to continuously evolve the nature of data in each of those components, and more importantly, the ability to integrate and interact across and among those components in a way that we get the optimal effect outcome and therefore the optimal value. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, until some of this changes a patient's life with a disease, it hasn't achieved its appropriate value. And so finally, one of the last things I want to touch upon is the intersection of physical and life science. This is perhaps probably, I think, one of the most exciting of all of the various determinants, and there are many, that will shape this butterfly, this, this new reality in medicine. We have traditionally thought, especially in Western medicine, of, of the cell as a bag of fluid in which chemical reactions occur. And that is literally true and correct. But it is also true and correct that we can think of the cell also as a solid state in which there are electromagnetic forces that are operative, that are affecting biological processes, or if you will, gene expression, et cetera. And so we're beginning to see that there is a fundamental basis within biology for us to begin to think in terms of two different realities coincident and co co coinciding together, and that both chemical and physical elements may affect life science, and that, we, uh, and that we're beginning to see this convergence of all of the body of knowledge that determines physical forces and physical uh, dynamics beginning to have significant application to life science. And at the same time, it's beginning, as you have been discussing here today, moving us from what was a macroscopic view a microscopic view, a molecular view, to now an atomic view of life, or life at the nanoscale. And that has significant implications. So I've, I, I've mentioned and talked about the fact that physical processes can occur now in, in solid state that affect the entire reaction that occurs in, 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 with regard to physical forces. And if you are doubting that, if any of you have children, you've probably spent a fair amount of money for braces and orthodonture. And so think about that for a second. You apply a force to teeth and the bone remodels and teeth move. They don't fall out, they move, because the bone remodeled. Some cells made bone, and some cells dissolved bone, all because of constant physical force. There's more to the story. So the liver is pretty much a chemical laboratory. It's primarily, for the most part, in my opinion, or my view, a chemistry factory. The cell is a bag of fluid and chemical reactions occur. The heart gets even in more interesting, and now here we begin to see a very dynamic kind of integration or interaction between the chemical foundational pieces 
and importantly, the beginning emergence of the mechanical and electrical components that may determine life. But when we get to the brain, well, that's where it really all starts to become particularly wild. And so we're going to see over these next few years a beginning new way of thinking about and approaching not just disease, but normal function as it relates to different organs in terms of how they are responding, reacting, or being determined by this complex integration between what I'll call chemistry and physics. And the brain is, going, is, is basically probably right now the seed or the source of the most exciting kind of study that's occurring with regard to our understanding of the physical forces that are operative in brain function. And it isn't just simply how the brain itself uh, is, is um, functioning by virtue of simple synapses, but the very fundamental kinds of things that are occurring with regard to thought and consciousness and the ability to alter or change those. So I'll give you one simple example quickly to make the point of the brain. I've seen Department of Defense studies and, f and videos where pa uh, patients with traumatic brain injury that have totally, completely lost their ability for balance. And so when one patient's walking down the corridor, cannot walk down the corridor, has to hold on to the wall in order to stay upright. And at the end of the corridor, there's a box. And they can't go beyond the box. They take a stimulator, electrical stimulator, and they place it in the mouth that stimulates the hypoglossal nerve, which, as you know, is a cranial nerve, goes directly to the brain. That starts to alter or change plasticity in the brain, which makes it susceptible to reprogramming. And so while that's occurring, patients are put through a reprogramming exercise of physical activity that starts to send different kinds of signals into the brain, which is now receptive in ways it wasn't receptive before. And after a period of time, and I don't remember the specific old details, six months or so of intermittent process and training, the next video you see is this patient walks down the hall and jumps over the box. You don't get that just from the physical therapy. You have to first be changing the electrical activity in the brain in a way that it biologically changes its ability to re reprogram itself, create new circuits that weren't there before. So the brain is, is really becoming an increasingly exciting area for this, this understanding of the intersection between the two. Um, we, have theoret we have traditionally applied physical energy to biological systems uh, to get readouts, diagnostic readouts. We apply ultrasound and we get a picture. We apply radiation and we get an x-ray. And we apply uh, magnetic fields and we get an MRI. But what we're increasingly appreciating is the application of physical energy has these unique ability to create biological functions. And so we now know with ultrasound, not only can we thermally denature protein, and uh, not only can we rupture and, uh, and disrupt cellular uh, membranes with high focus or high intensity focused ultrasound or histotripsy, but we can also alter biology. So we're seeing the ability to alter the blood brain barrier with the application of ultrasound. We're beginning to see altered gene expression uh, with, with application of physical energy. And where this is becoming increasingly important is in the whole field of regenerative medicine. So I alluded to earlier the fact that you needed a cell and you needed a soil. You need a cell and you need a matrix. But it's increasingly apparent that you also need to understand the role that physical forces will play in ultimately determination of the generation of tissue and of organs. If you don't have those physical forces, those cells, those growth factors, that biomatrix doesn't do anything. 
I've also alluded to the, the, some of the other things that are occurring. One of the other aspects that I think is increasingly important to the, what you all are engaged in today in this discussion of nanotechnology is that as we've gotten down into this new level of, of our ability to probe biological systems, we're finding out that as in physics, there's a completely new reality that's emerging. We know in physics that there are um, physical states that are governed by Newtonian physics. Drop an apple, it's going to hit the ground. But when you get down to the atomic level, you have a completely different reality such that we never can know where the electron is because of Heisenberg's principle. You're now in quantum state. And what we're beginning to appreciate is that there is a quantum state in biology. There are things that are occurring that cannot be explained in, in our traditional concepts of, of chemistry or, or in our traditional concepts of biology. And so what we'll see in the 21st century is the emergence of an entire new field of study of life processes at the quantum level. And, it be in, and it, it, the emergence of quantum biology will be one of the, I think, one of the most exciting frontiers of medicine. MRI, the application of that magnetic field, and as it alters the orientation of protons, that creates a quantum state. That is only the first of what will likely be a series of ongoing understandings and, and, and um, if you will, perspectives of how we might start to alter life processes at that very fundamental level if we begin to understand some of the rules, some of the laws that govern life at that level. And there are some examples in nature where there are migratory birds that are able to navigate space in ways that there are no normal physiologic functions that can explain that. They can only be explained at the quantum state, at the quantum level. And as most of you know from, from your physics, the quantum world is a very weird and strange world. And I'll leave Moro to explain that to you because he's far smarter about it than I am. And so you, especially you here at Methodist, because you've been open to the ability to explore these new worlds, these new ideas, whether it's nanotechnology and cardiovascular disease and, the, and these amazing things that you do here, you're immersed in this, in this metamorphosis. You're where those scientists were 100 years ago who were unraveling the secrets of the atom and its nucleus. You're unraveling the secrets of the cell, and you're engaged in that metamorphosis. And the three things that are going to you know, change everyone's life, and you're going to be the architect of that, is medicine as a digital world. It is a digital world, and they are access to information, the data that you can measure, the very nature of the data that you can measure, the ability to manipulate and alter and change that, that programming is, is unprecedented. You can see technology that continues to emerge that will in, in affect things like um, stem cell biology and regenerative medicine. You're seeing the, the ability to integrate solutions. And most importantly, you're beginning to see integrative biology, where physical and, and, and life sciences are coming together in ways we never imagined before. So you're immersed in the metamorphosis, and the only thing that's certain about it is that the future won't look like anything like the past. It's an ecosystem transformation. It's not one thing that's changing. Everything is changing. There won't be anything that's going to be exactly like it was. It's all going to change. And we're still in the process of not quite fully understanding what that's going to look like, but we know what it's not going to look like. 
And so you're going to see new structures, new functions, new ways of doing things. The one thing that is true about this new future is it's all interconnected and interoperable. There are, there are no islands in this reality. The wing has got to be attached to the body and the antenna has got to be attached. It's not going to be a matter of silos anymore. That won't work. And so it's going to require a lot of adaptation and a lot of change and a lot of openness uh, to make the world what it can be. But what it will result in is unprecedented. Our ability to take control of life like we took control of the atom, our ability to take control of life will alter longevity, vitality, it will determine productivity and, and absolutely prosperity for those who are ahead of the game. And the surest way to predict this future is for you to invent it. See, the, cat, the, the butterfly's metamorphosis, or the caterpillar's metamorphosis, is predetermined and predestined. It was predetermined that it was, that it was predestined that it was going to occur. And it was predetermined that that caterpillar was going to be a butterfly. Our, our metamorphosis is predestined. It's already happening. You can't change it. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. It's, it's happening. But what isn't certain is what it's going to be. So we get to define what it's going to be. It, we can make that butterfly what we want but we're going to do it in the context of what you've created here. The ability to be thoughtful, visionary, exploratory, and most importantly, work together in an environment that's feeding uh, your creativity and your innovation. So congratulations for that. It's a privilege for me to be able to come back to Houston from Washington and all the craziness that's, that's there. Um, to be able to celebrate what you're doing here, and most importantly, uh, to let you know how critically important it is because there's so many people suffering and dying out there that need what you have the ability to create. Thank you.